Hi, my name is Jean Atelsek. I'm a senior research analyst at 451 Research, which is a division of S&P Global Market Intelligence. Joining me today is Bill Roth, who's the director of cloud economics at VMware. Thanks for joining us, Bill. Great to be here. Today, we're going to be talking about, not surprisingly, cloud economics. And let's just start with uh, what is cloud economics as far as you're concerned, Bill? Well, cloud economics breaks down sort of into two pieces. Economics, as we know, is the, the, the study of human decision-making or how people make decisions in an economic context. So cloud economics is about how decisions get made about cloud. Now that includes obviously things like pricing, but also the way people think about pricing and to think about cloud and how they make their decisions about how to be successful when they move assets into the cloud, when they operate in the cloud, or where, where they manage. The so cloud. one of my uh, roles at 451 Research is to um, work on the Cloud Price Index, which is a benchmarking service that looks at trends over time and across uh, the globe uh, in terms of cloud pricing. Um, what are the trends that you've seen in, in uh, cloud economics? Well, I'm glad you asked, and as you know, I'm a huge fan of the Cloud Price Index. And so the trends that we're seeing, I think, are really threefold. The first is we're seeing a change in sort of the flow of workloads. What that means is that previously, three, four years ago, a lot of workloads were moving from on-premise data centers into the cloud. Now we're actually seeing either a motion of within the cloud, but actually the amount of workloads that are moving from on-premise data center has certainly sort of uh, has diminished. The second major trend that we're seeing is a move to multi-cloud. Uh, and so meaning that customers will often intentionally have more than one cloud, either as a way to hedge risk or uh, perhaps to take advantage of uh, specific features. The third is the third major trend that I'm seeing is actually repatriations. And what's happening is whether due to security issues or doing to reliability issues, what we're seeing is that actually some workloads are actually moving back on premise as people get a handle on what their spend is. So this actually raises a question because as I mentioned, I am a huge fan of the uh, cloud price index. Um, it's my impression that hyperscalers are actually slowing down their price decreases. Initially, that was a fairly big deal. Uh, and so I wanted to know, Gene, based on the work that you've done on the cloud, cloud price index, uh, what have you been seeing? So I'll say in 2021, we definitely saw VM prices flatten out. Um, you know, five years ago, the hyperscalers in particular were cutting prices sort of as a way of getting attention, as kind of a land grab for getting workloads onto their clouds. Um, what we've seen in the past year is that pricing has pretty much leveled out for virtual machines. On the other hand, um, services further up the stack, and in particular in 2021, databases and uh uh, analytics um, saw some price decreases. So we're seeing some uh, softness in pricing for uh, managed services, but in terms of infrastructure, uh, that's holding pretty steady. Interesting. Now, your latest iteration of the Cloud Price Index came, uh, came out earlier this year. Can you summarize? It sounds like that was some of the findings, but did, what else have you found recently in terms of what's going on uh, in general movements with pricing? Well, for one thing, we're seeing pricing going up in some cases. So, uh, for instance, this month, Google announced some um, previously free services that are going to start being unfree as of October 1st. Uh, and they um, actually uh, upped pricing on some of their data transfer charges, which have been a sore spot for a lot of cloud users because this is a, a charge that doesn't figure into the initial um, provisioning of infrastructure, the movement of data in and out of cloud. So that's uh, that's one thing that we're seeing that's um, pretty interesting. And 
With inflation and supply chain issues, uh, I think we can expect to see prices going up and it'll be um, uh, curious to see how that happens. Have you seen any uh, changes in capacity that might have resulted from supply chain? So are there certain regions, for example, that, uh, or do, do you even see that if, uh, for example, there's not enough inventory in a particular region? Is that, are those things that the cloud price index would uncover? So we don't look at what we do basically is apples to apples comparisons of services that are widely available. Um, so we haven't seen any supply chain constraints. As you know, uh, there are, you know, there's a lot of capacity in these global data center, um, uh, these global cloud data centers. And um, some of it is even, you know, sort of offered to customers at a big discount um, because they want to be making money from what they have online. So I would say that uh, the build out is still early enough and um, the cloud adoption is still not intense enough for there to be supply chain constraints in terms of cloud capacity. I want to move to an article that uh, was published on March 10th, which sort of really triggered the economist part of my brain. In this article, I think you posit that the hyperscalers look to grow around, I believe it was 20% sort of this year. But interestingly, they're also doing some interesting uh, moves to sort of sweat their hardware. In other words, they're actually lengthening the depreciation cycle. And so I wonder, is this a way to, uh, is this margin driven? Is it sort of simply a way to kind of improve the economics? Is this economic pressure that Wall Street is placing on the hyperscalers? How do you interpret that? Yeah, that's a really interesting phenomenon. Each of the big three cloud providers, and that is AWS, uh, Microsoft Azure, and Google Cloud, They've all extended the depreciation schedules on their servers and networking equipment. Um, I think there are several reasons for that. For one thing, it is um, it was incredible. I believe that AWS uh, said that it was going to um, add to their revenues uh, to the tune of a billion dollars just in the first quarter of this year. So um, it is definitely a way of sweating their assets. Uh, another factor, I believe that most of the processors in uh, hyperscale data centers, still the, the large share of them are Intel processors. And um, the sort of delays in the rollout of Intel's um, uh, seven nanometer um, uh, process for making the semiconductors that power those uh, hyperscaler servers uh, has sort of slow down the technology refresh that um, the hyperscalers are willing to do. That's a fascinating point. Do you see any major changes related to pricing or economics it, based on that uh, the balance between Intel, AMD and other types of chips? Do you see do you see any sort of appreciable effects as uh, you look at the data between the sort of the basket of processors that hyperscalers are using? Yes, absolutely. In fact, uh, the the steepest drop that we've seen in VM pricing in the cloud price index was in 2020, and it was due to the introduction of newer, uh, more performant uh, processors. So that has had the biggest impact on infrastructure pricing since we've been tracking um, the data, which is from uh, 2015. So, um, and, and as you know, AMD uh, processors have been making um, inroads into the, into the hyperscaler data centers. And because they are um, using a, a more advanced process um, and are more performant, uh, you know, that is, that is what has enabled the uh, hyperscalers to continue reducing their um, the pricing on their virtual machines. Interesting. So have you uh, looked at overall cloud migration costs? I know you focus on the cost of services and the cost of uh, VMs. 
uh, and things like that. But if you looked at the overall cost of cloud migration, cloud change, uh, processes? Is that something that fits in the report? So we have in the past looked at um, sort of a break-even um, analysis of public versus private cloud. And um, what we found is that the uh, where that, that juncture comes depends on the um, utilization of the private cloud servers and also the efficiency of the engineers and how many um, uh, servers they can manage at a time. Now, the interesting thing about that was that, you know, in the public cloud, at the time that we did the research, we were presuming 100% uh, utilization of the public cloud. Well, when, when you describe, you know, pay per use for public cloud. It really is uh, when you're talking about VMs. It's pay per provision, and there's a lot of waste in the in the cloud as well. So, in, you know, in the public cloud as well. So, um, what I think what we're seeing lately is that DevOps practices have uh, sort of reduced the level of weight, waste and um, closer matched uh, provisioning of. Uh, infrastructure to actual application demands um, and so you know that's one factor that uh, you know we've seen that's going to impact the balance of on and off-prem um, deployments. It's interesting because our research shows sort of a couple of things and as we look at that on-prem versus cloud analysis we find that they're highly susceptible to cost of hardware and essentially storage are the two, there's lots of variables. Our model has over 200 variables, but the two that drive it are what is the price of the hardware on-prem versus and the price of the storage. So there's a considerable discounting. We actually see that has uh, a fairly big effect on the economics of an entire project. The second thing we see in sort of as a somebody who's um, you know, a fan of behavioral economics, what we see is that oftentimes people look at it and they make their decision based only on acquisition cost. What they focus on tends to be sort of what is my year one cost and not necessarily figuring out long term costs or migration costs. And that's essentially where we've been working with customers to help them get an entire, you know, a, a broader view of what their cloud spend is. But obviously at the core, is the cost of the service. And that's why something like the cloud price index is so important to customers. That's interesting. One thing that we've been seeing with the price increases is that the providers have been introducing intermediate levels of service to enable customers who don't want to um, incur the price increase to uh, take a lower level of service, maybe fewer nines or, or less bandwidth. Um, for their workloads that might not be, be as demanding. I think there's also some really interesting economic kind of interplay here. Whereas on-prem, you wouldn't necessarily, there's not as big a need because of the upfront CapEx. There's not as much of a need to optimize. And so I think that one of the things that the hyperscalers are being pretty good at is coming up with pricing ranges, ranges as well as helping people understand cost management which gives a fairly strong incentive to start optimizing. And this comes from, there's a, there's a standard thing that happens in developers and sort of operations where developers always want as much resource as possible. And oftentimes that's based on our experience, roughly probably 30% more memory and compute than is really actually needed. So it is a pretty interesting interplay between pricing and optimization that are leading to, I think, kind of the, the right behavior for businesses, but the complexity uh, does tend to uh, require a bit of thoughtfulness, I think. Well, we could talk about this for hours, uh, but I think that's probably a good stopping point. It's been great um, talking about cloud economics with you, Bill. Thanks for coming. It's a pleasure to be here, Gene. And if anyone wants to find out more information about cloud economics at VMware, go to vmware.com slash cloud economics. And then if you'd like to learn more about the Cloud Price Index or 451 Research, go to 451research.com.